By the time this video publishes, I will probably be a bit late to the party, but I wanted to address the idea that protein acidifies the body and makes you calcium deficient that have popped up yet again recently. I'll address the calcium deficiency stuff first because it won't take long. You just have to look at frail vegans to see this is not true. In fact, you absorb a lot more calcium when you have more protein in the diet. So the explanation for these studies showing you excrete more when you have more protein is that you're absorbing more. So that's kind of obvious and you can just see when you look at how strong the bones are of people who eat a lot of meat like weightlifters. Your bones aren't really made of calcium either. They're mostly made of collagen and therefore protein will do much more to make strong bones. And glycine in particular is going to do much more to build your bones than anything else you can take. Plant calcium is also generally locked up in plants as calcium oxalate. And therefore plants are not a good source of calcium. And in modern intensive agriculture, there won't be much calcium in your produce anyhow. Even if it's organic, there's mainly going to be oxalates and other poisons. The explanation about acidity is a little more technical and boils down to some shady theoretical logic on the part of plant food advocates that just doesn't stand up when you actually test it experimentally. Unfortunately, these guys will never give up and they just keep coming back with new nonsense every week. And unfortunately, many people are fooled. Uh, the more times you bang yourself on the head without it falling off, the more intelligent you are. You've got to go for it. He's going for it! <laughs> Can you feel it? Yeah. Can you feel it? Yeah. Can you feel it? Yeah. Go! Go on, please. Go on. Go on, Go on. First off, can you be deficient at all when eating meat only? In spite of what some will tell you, of course you can. Now if you eat two pounds of beef a day and nothing else, you will get your minimum levels of choline, but you're not going to get the optimal levels. And you're bound to be deficient in taurine and glycine compared to an ancestral diet if all you eat is hamburger and steak because the cuts of meat really do matter. There's 10 times as much taurine in oxtail and the smaller muscles like the cheek and tongue than there is in a steak. Since both of these increase mitochondrial health and efficiency, and considering the vital role your mitochondria play in the body, and for cancer prevention, and for metabolic health and type 2 diabetes prevention, I would call anything less than peak mitochondrial health deficiency. Remember, these studies are only short term. They're only looking at severe problems. They're not looking at lifespan, which is very difficult to look at. In fact, taurine deficiency is being studied as one of the main drivers of aging in animals and humans today. And in studies in animals, they've extended lifespan by around 25% by increasing dietary taurine over what they're getting in their kibble. In dogs with dilated mitocarditis, the recommended taurine supplementation for small dogs is one gram a day. That is about the same as a grown man taking five to 10 grams per day on top of his usual dietary intake. And I take six grams a day because you really can't have too much taurine and it's going to make your mitochondria work better. So it's crazy not to take as much as you can get down. I would take even more, it's just difficult to get that much down. And these doses are just responses to obvious critical nutritional issues. They're not designed to provide optimal levels. And if you want optimal levels, you're going to have to do more than what's recommended. It's theorized that deficiency in many nutrients like vitamin K2 and taurine are driving much of disease today. Keep in mind that without both taurine and K2, your immune cells simply cannot remove plaque in the body. And without taurine, your body can't synthesize any proteins at all. Low taurine intake also drives homocysteine levels in the body, which is a major contributor to heart disease and cancer. And low levels of methionine will make things even worse. 
Let's go back to 1918 for a minute. This is Elmer V. McCollum, nutrition researcher. This is the, a book he wrote, The Newer Knowledge of Nutrition. And this is extraordinary, it covers thousands of animal studies because they really wanted to know what was going on with diet. They wanted to understand what it was that was driving health. And uh, I'm gonna give you an example here. And there's extraordinary studies. This is just one of, one of many. All right, so they take diets. Now these rats, rats are usually weaned at about 25, 26 days. And then they put these two, these two sets of rats on identical diets, except for one thing, the fat source. All right, so the rats on the left get 5% cottonseed oil. The rats on the right, 1.5% butter fat. That's all the fat they got, 1.5%. Here's what happens to them. The rats on the cottonseed oil um, grow to 60% of normal size and live 555 days on average. They're weak, fragile, sickly little rats. The rats on the butter fat, they are healthy, they grow to normal size, and they live 1,020 days. So they grow to almost twice the size, live twice as long, and are infinitely more healthy. Why? Anybody? Why? Fat soluble vitamins, A, D, and K2, right? Those are not in any kind of vegetable oil, any kind of oil at all, in fact, uh, that comes from plants. You're gonna see this next. So McCollum says this in 1918, 1918, just look at the part I have underlined here. The diet must contain two as yet unidentified substances or groups of substances. One was fat soluble vitamins, the other water soluble. He says, one of these is associated with certain fats and is especially abundant in butter fat, egg yolk fats, and the fats of the glandular organs such as the liver and kidney. That's all the fantastically healthy foods, right? Right there. He says, but is not found in any fats or oils of vegetable origin. Even the healthy oils, coconut, palm, palm kernel, avocado oil, uh, uh, real true olive oil. They don't have vitamins A, D, and K2, right? They're not there. He continues, McCollum, 1918, he says, both the growth promoting fat, which is butter, and the trace of unidentified substance in the alcoholic extract of wheat germ, which was the B vitamins, are necessary for the promotion of growth or the preservation of health. We don't just need these vitamins to grow people, we need them in adulthood and old age in order to, to sustain us in good health. And this is what we continually overlook, especially when we focus on macronutrients, I believe. And, and for the moment, consider diets where, that are unsupplemented with vitamins, all right? So if you consume 100% of your fats from traditionally raised animals, whether they be on land, at sea, or from fresh water, and you consume no processed foods, you are likely to be extremely lean, healthy, and live a long and healthy, good life. You're gonna probably look like a Maasai warrior. And if you're not that way now, eat like that, and you'll start getting that direction. You'll move that direction. On the other hand, if you consume 100% of your fats from the polyunsaturated vegetable oils, you will rapidly become ill, severely metabolically deranged, stunted growth in childhood, almost certainly overweight and, ob and or obese in adulthood, and your life will be cut extremely short. You'll meet your end extremely prematurely. And it won't matter if you're one month old or 90 years old. This is a scientifically proven mathematical certainty. Our ancestors in the 19th century regularly ate beef heart, oxtail for taurine, broth for glycine, and brain for phosphatidylcholine. We also ate much more seafood historically, and this was the main staple food for most of the world before population expansion led to widespread overfishing. This provided large amounts of EPA, DHA, glycine, and taurine, which are very difficult to make up without taking supplements today. With that said, calcium is not something we lack in the diet at all. If anything, we have too much, especially when it comes to inorganic calcium, which is very harmful. This is what hard arterial plaque is made of. And in general, it's very difficult to be genuinely deficient in minerals if you eat a healthy diet with plenty of animal products. The main source of mineral deficiency is plant foods because they have 
not only toxins that reduce your absorption, but they have the wrong ratios of minerals. And this tends to drive down your zinc and magnesium levels over time. Since these are the minerals that people are generally deficient in, it makes it doubly silly to try and take in more calcium. Due to osmosis, this is going to drive out even more magnesium and zinc because every time you take some minerals in, some are gonna come out unless they're all in the exact right ratios. And these are the ratios that you'll find it in your bloodstream and also in most animal products. The idea that meat leads to acidity in the body is one of the founding tenets of vegan nutritional dogma. Protein in meat is also slightly acidic and that sounds bad, but there are a lot of things to consider. First off, what's the consequence? Why is acidity so bad? Simply put, your body has to work hard to reduce acidity in the body, and it does so in a somewhat destructive manner. The kidney performs this task, and it has to use amino acids to do so, and may even need to strip magnesium from your bones. In other words, excessive acidity leads to loss of protein and minerals. So what these people are really saying is that consuming protein will make you deficient in protein and in magnesium. That's a bit absurd, don't you think? Eating protein makes you protein deficient and eating the best source of available minerals in their proper proportions is going to make you mineral deficient. If there's one thing I can't stand, it's crazy people. <laughs> If that were true, then we'd be in a lot of trouble, and in fact, we would have gone extinct a long time ago. Since protein plays a role in removing acidity, then this is even more proof of how important protein in the diet really is. It's much better to use amino acids in the bloodstream than it is to destroy your own lean tissue, like vegans are doing. Does the diet affect the acid-base balance of the body? Okay, and I've published a couple papers on this. So I'm gonna sort of take some of that data um, that I've published and, and also data from others to sort of kind of cover how this works. This is extremely complex. Now, over the long run, um, a lot of people say you can just breathe out acid, but there's a cost to doing that. So in order to breathe out hydrogen ions or protons, which are the acid in your body, you have to um, basically deplete the body of one molecule of bicarbonate. So you're really not altering the acid-base balance of the body in the long run because you are depleting one molecule of bicarbonate per molecule of hydrogen. So the body has to call upon the kidneys to get rid of acid um, in order to meaningfully, over the long term, uh, alter the pH of the body. Um, and the effect, the negative effect too of trying to breathe out a lot of acid is again, you're depleting your bicarbonate stores. Um, and then there's negative effects of actually eliminating a lot of acid um, out the body with the kidneys because your kidneys can do that, but they have a limited capacity to do that as well. So, so there's a cost because ammonia is toxic to the kidneys. Now we don't exactly know how much dietary acid will lead to how much ammonia which will lead to X, you know, harmful effect, but. Now this much of what he says is true. In fact, your kidneys create bicarbonate to reduce acidity in the body. And this is one of the most taxing activities it performs. And this is why it's very hard to regenerate your kidneys because it's constantly working to do this. You can not only increase exercise performance, but also help your kidneys a great deal just by supplementing bicarbonate. And anything that raises acidity in the body does the opposite. It's bad for the kidneys and it ultimately destroys your lean muscle mass, even if it's tiny amounts over time. Since CO2 is acidic, anything that impairs the ability of your body to expel CO2 is also very bad for you. The problem is his own words debunk the idea that acidity comes from the diet. You not only produce acidity from exercise, but you produce it all day long in every single cell due to energy metabolism for your entire life. And this is where the vast, vast majority of all acid production comes from in the body. And it just doesn't really matter what you eat. We have randomized studies in people 
who have, let's say, low-grade metabolic acidosis, when you give them alkaline-forming substances, it improves kidney health and it improves bone health. So that's really one of the, the quick ways you can test to see if altering your acid-base balance actually does have a negative or positive effect. You gotta take someone who actually has metabolic acidosis, give them alkaline-forming supplements, and we have numerous randomized trials to show this, because then you can see if there's a negative or a beneficial effect fairly quickly. I agree that bicarbonate supplementation is good for the kidneys, at least to some extent. That's undeniable, but blaming it on meat is misguided. While ammonia is produced as a byproduct of protein metabolism, this happens based on your hormonal status and your protein usage, not how much protein you eat. If your body used every bit of protein you took in, you would immediately die of ammonia poisoning. That's exactly what happens with rabbit starvation. Your body is starving and you're eating nothing but protein and it tries to convert large amounts into energy and it quickly kills you. Thankfully, that only happens when your body has no other choice but to burn lots of lean tissue and when you eat a very large amount of protein at the same time while well, you have a very low amount of body fat. When you break a fast or eat carnivore long term, so long as you have a little fat with your meal, you should not have any issues with excessive gluconeogenesis. That means your body will only make use of most amino acids as building blocks, not as fuel, and the ones it doesn't use will just pass harmlessly out of the body. The gluconeogenesis will then mainly occur using glycerol, which is the backbone of fat molecules, and that's actually where almost all of your gluconeogenesis comes from. Saying you can control acid from eating more or less protein is like saying you can control how much CO2 your body produces. You just can't. All you can control is whether you are deficient in protein or not. And when you're deficient in protein, that means you don't have amino acids in your bloodstream to get rid of acidity. And when your body needs to get rid of it, it's going to rip it out of your collagen. And keep in mind that the diet of vegans is particularly deficient in all of the amino acids that are used for this. This is obviously very bad for your skin and bones. That is part of the reason that vegans age so badly, though a lack of glycine intake, low glutathione levels, and accelerated glycation destroying elastin and collagen are also big problems. Not to mention that they have zero taurine in their diet, which is probably the very most important nutrient most people are lacking today. When you eat more protein, you don't produce more acidity, but you do have more glutamine to make ammonia, so getting rid of acidity is just less of an issue. If you still doubt, look up how much ammonia could be made from the nitrogen in a gram of protein. If this crazy robotic process occurred, and all excess protein was obliterated and turned into ammonia, you would make a similar amount of pure ammonia to your daily protein intake. Ammonia is highly toxic and this would lead to your demise in no time at all. That takes care of the input side, and even on Wikipedia, you can easily look up and see that gluconeogenesis is not driven by protein consumption. And this debunks this side of the argument completely before it even gets off the ground. And it amazes me that people can promote things that are just obviously untrue and have been proven wrong experimentally like this. The other side of the equation is the intake of citrate and bicarbonate. Remember the big problem, the very worst case scenario, is that acidity will cause kidney issues. That's what we're really worried about. Well guess what's terrible for your kidneys? Citric acid. Even small amounts cause kidney stone problems, and it is many, many times worse in this regard than oxalate. Along with sugar, wheat, and toxic veg oil, it is ubiquitous in packaged foods. It's also generally biosynthetic, grown in a vat of black goo fed on soybean oil, and it's full of allergenic byproducts, so you definitely want to avoid it. Earlier, I told a lie. Calcium is not the last nutrient someone is liable to be deficient in. It's definitely citrate. If you can even call it a nutrient, since the amount you need in the diet is a big fat zero, and the amount you should take in would ideally be zero too. 
Citrate is involved in a lot of processes in the body, but it doesn't necessarily drive them. Saying that it is needed for creating bicarbonate is like saying water is needed for generating ATP. Being involved doesn't mean something drives this process, and taking in more citrate will definitely not increase bicarbonate production in the kidney. If it did, there would be exercise performance benefits to taking citrate, just like there is for bicarbonate, but all you get is kidney stones. You don't have to take my word for it though. Here's a study that concluded citrate intake does not increase bicarbonate production. In fact, it seems to be a metabolic poison because it actually reduces fat burning within cells. And while I don't know exactly why that's going on, that's highly alarming because this is gonna cause insulin resistance over time. But at the end of the day, no, experimentally, it's proven that taking in citrate definitely does not increase bicarbonate production. And that means the rest of the argument is pretty much debunked too. So the only sad hope for the amazing health benefits of fruits and vegetables left is bicarbonate. Keep in mind you tend to get much more citrate in fruits and vegetables than bicarbonate. And we just found out that citrate murders your kidneys and impairs cellular metabolism which is going to lead to insulin resistance and cancer over time. Even so, yes, bicarbonate production from fruits and vegetables is good for you. However, it's not good enough to improve your kidney function no matter how much you eat. And you can only eat so much of it. There's only a modest effect that's going to happen from eating fruits and vegetables even when half of your diet or more is made up of them. And in studies, it was much less effective than just taking bicarbonate, which itself has been judged to be ineffective for repairing the kidney. So any way you slice it, there's just no significant benefit possible. And you can scale up bicarbonate to take twice as much, three times as much, four times as much. And that's exactly what I do. On the other hand, people who go low carb or do extended fasts, do get kidney function improvements and sometimes it's dramatic. The real culprit in kidney disease is high blood pressure, taurine and glycine deficiency, and fatty liver disease. High blood pressure is mainly driven by high insulin levels caused by a low fat, high carb diet. When you add fat to a meal, it blunts the effects of insulin and cortisol. Eating fewer meals per day also helps a great deal in this respect. When you snack all day on low fat, high carb snacks like most people today, this constantly spikes insulin and cortisol and directly drives up your blood pressure and your blood sugar levels over time. You can eat all the vegetables in the world and the best it's gonna do is just slow down the damage but only as compared to a standard American diet. So basically compared to eating processed food which is terrible for you. And you could get much more benefit by simply taking bicarbonate. I do this every day and I neutralize it with vinegar. This does not dull the deacidifying properties at all. In fact, it amplifies them. Bicarbonate supplementation takes pressure off the kidneys. And vinegar has many effects including acting as pure energy in the mitochondria. This form of energy skips the creation of acidic byproducts in energy metabolism within cells and increases the fat burning capacity of cells, the opposite of what citrate does. And that's why insulin resistance is lowered when you take vinegar, and I would presume that it's raised when you take in citrate. I take 60 milligrams of vinegar with a teaspoon of potassium bicarbonate every day, and I double that on days I'm going to work out with weights. Keep in mind though, if you have kidney failure, you may not be able to take potassium at all, and you may need to limit sodium, but these are very complex topics, so you're going to have to figure that out on your own and with your doctor. The ultimate solution though, is lowering your insulin levels. A 24 hour fast reduces insulin levels to 40% of your starting level. And if your diet is good when you break the fast, you can keep it down permanently after just one fast. Fasting also quickly removes liver fat from the liver, and liver fat drives metabolic dysfunction by limiting the ability of the body to deal with blood glucose spikes. 
If you can keep your insulin down, you can not only stop further kidney damage, but even reverse it. Growth hormone release from an extended fast will actually increase organ size and function in the body. Taurine will also help repair the kidney, and glycine and choline are very protective of the kidney. TMG or trimethylglycine is a methyl donor supplement that is similar to choline and it works even better for liver and kidney protection. It simply amazes me that so much funding and time and effort is spent on nonsense topics trying to show that fruits and vegetables have amazing nutritional powers. They don't and they tend to just throw up this idea and this possibility left and right but when you look at the actual data, there just isn't anything there. I'd also say that when you're promoting not eating meat, what you're really promoting is processed foods because the organic whole fruits and vegetables diet is incredibly expensive and most people are never gonna be able to afford it and they're not gonna be able to do it and they're just not gonna be able to stick to these foods that don't really taste that good. Now this guy claims that he does eat meat and there is some logical sense to supplementing bicarbonate, and I do it myself. Unfortunately, the rest simply doesn't pan out, especially when it comes to citrate intake. And this is a chemical that causes big problems for the kidney and for metabolic health. And keep in mind that citrate is used as a preservative. It kills off bacteria, just like formaldehyde does. And that's why it's in all of these packaged foods. And that means it'll probably kill you off too. And that seems to be the case. This stuff should be avoided as much as possible. It's just not good for you. And it's not in these fruits and vegetables for your benefit. It's to kill off insects. Carbohydrates are also a problem, especially in the context of a low fat diet with many meals per day and processed carbs like sugar, wheat, and mashed potatoes or even worse. Promotion of plant-based foods is dogma in the government, the universities, and of course in the food industry itself, and this colors all discussion and research. Even so, when you actually look at the data and cut through the noise, it's amazing how little substance there really is to these arguments. Looks like I'm next. <laughs> Good thing, too. I gotta do a photo shoot for GQ in about an hour and a half. Hey, what are you doing? Hey, stop it! Hey, you're messing up here! Come on! Whoa!